one of the most iconic pro skateboarders of the 1990s, Keith Huffnagel, used his impressive skate skills to escape the streets of New York City and establish himself as a top player in the West Coast skate industry. Then, in 2002, Huff took another risk and opened a skate clothing boutique in San Francisco. Today, his clothing brand, Huff, is respected worldwide as one of the key streetwear brands. My name's Eli Morgan Gessner, and I'm the co-founder of Fat Farm, Zoo York, and a whole bunch of other shit. I'm also the style editor here at Uprox. So I came up with this show as an excuse to sit down with my friends and the defining figures behind today's creative culture. This is The Masters. Hey, thanks for coming. Good to see you. Good seeing you too, Keith Huffnagel. Ladies and gentlemen, Keith Huffnagel. Keith, um, me and you have kind of had some similar comparisons in our lives. We're both native New Yorkers. We started our skateboarding career in New York City and then we went on to the rag trade. So let's go back and talk about what was it like for you growing up in New York City? I mean, for me, you know, I think I always had a skateboard around. I had a skateboard when I was four years old. What? How, why? I think it was just a Christmas present one year and it wasn't a good skateboard, it was like a plastic one. Mm -hmm. And um, we would just kneeboard around. Like we would just kind of like push on our knees and ride around our neighborhood. Really? Just Where not even- Where did you grow up? I grew up on 23rd and 1st. That's and what Peter, I thought. Peter Cooper Stuyvesant. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so but you're, you're not even standing up pushing, you're just kneeboarding. No, kneeboarding. As a little baby inside yeah. of Stuy Town. Yeah. yeah. But then when I turned, I think it was more when I was like 12, 13, so more like 1985-ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got like a, a real skateboard for my, uh, my birthday. It was like a Vision Jinx. Oh, you know, okay. it was like old school, like big wheels, right. short nose. And that was when I really found skateboarding and started to like enjoy it and learn about it and follow it and get the magazines and get the right. the, vid the videotapes and all that and and then that was the part that kind of let me start exploring new york city more because uh, i don't think i was even really aware of you until like 89. i was probably just a little rat running around you know i was where were you getting skateboards from Soho Skates. Soho Skates. And Skate NYC. No way. That's yeah. so weird. So we must have all been yeah. like hanging out. That was a weird time too because it was like skating died. And then I would say between like 88, 89, 90, 91, nobody was skateboarding. And the yeah. only place open that had skateboard anything was ODs. ODs was awesome for us because it was like a clubhouse. Yeah. It was in a very weird area. It was. <laughs> <laughs> There's crack whores yeah. everywhere. Yeah. I mean, we used to roll up and there was crack files everywhere. And also, that's a sidebar. How big a problem was that skateboarding in New York in the 80s, crack files? Because people talk about, like, I'm slinging crack now, but they're not slinging crack. No. There used to be so many crack files. Yeah, you, you, your wheel would catch a crack file and you'd fall. Yeah, I, uh, most, a lot of my worst injuries are because of crack files. <laughs> It's not a joke, it's the truth, man. <laughs> we would run into you guys, and you guys were really taking it to the next level. Like, I was already kind of over my skateboarding career at that point, but like you and Keenan and uh, uh, Steven Callis, yeah. when you guys were kind of like hitting Midtown during that time, it was like clear to me like, oh, these guys are gonna go do something great for New York, and then you like went to San Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> so we were being fed from magazines and VHS tapes right. that Skateboarding was California. Sure. When we were really in one of the best places to skateboard, but not knowing it because it was just normal. You got victimized by the California skate media. Yeah. yeah. Who, who was your first sponsor? I was skating Fuji Building one day, waiting for uh, Keenan Milton, and Shrugi was there, mm. and he was like, you watched me skate the whole time. He was like, send me your, video, send me your sponsor me tape. I want to get you on Spitfire and Thunder. And I yeah. was like, fuck yeah. And then like how we did it back then was Keenan and I did our, our sponsoring tapes together. Uh -huh. So we kind of made a package deal where like, you got to take both of us. <laughs> he filmed me and I filmed him. Yeah. So you got to sponsor us both. And it worked out. Sure, yeah. One day we called up and Ron Allen picked up the phone and he was like, we're going to start this company fun out of San Francisco. You guys should come with us. And we we're like, yeah. And right. that was kind of where it all just started. Right. And that was how Keenan and I took off to move to San Francisco, San Francisco and become part of a company. And then we were skating San Francisco. It was like, 
you know, at that time, Embarcadero was like the mecca. Yeah, it was the like spot. 1992, you go to Embarcadero, there's like 20 to 100 kids skateboarding. And it's like, it's a skate park plaza. I'm 100% honest. Is your, was your hair naturally that blonde? Or were you just like bleaching your hair? No, I was bleaching it nonstop. Oh, you were? Yeah. Oh. I had like, I've always, I was blonde as a kid and right. then I went brown. And then when I was skating, I used to change my hair color every fucking week. It was like blue, green, really? red. I have no recollection of you yeah. in any other color except shocking. No, I was like a, I was like hair. a skate punk. I would fucking go any color, everything. I went black, which was like the craziest. Oh, shit. I think I remember black. There's black, definitely. but I don't remember rainbow bright colors. When your video started dropping in the '90s, like your ollie's just insane. You could just ollie everything, stuff that I would uh, think was impossible. Yeah, I mean, when the video camera comes out, you, I would always say I'm gonna go a little bit faster and go a little bit higher, right. just because it's gonna look better. And it does. And you may fall a little bit harder here and there, yeah. but when you land it, it looks better. Yeah. And that's part of it. You, you, there's something about going fast on film and going big on film that looks good. Yeah. Now let me, just to, just to talk about this at this moment. Yeah. Here you are now, uh, having one of the most important, you know, streetwear brands. You know, I never thought of you like, you know, I, I never thought of you as like a fashion guy. You looked like a skater, as a skater should. So we're, did, were you even aware of that back then? No. No, I had no clue. I just, just honestly, skating. I just wanted to skate, and yeah. I loved, of course you love skate product because sure. you're, you want to represent and yeah. wear things. So I'd buy a skate product. Um, and so this entire, uh, the whole Huff thing, starts because you opened a skate shop? I started dating Ann, mm -hmm. who is the, my first Huff partner, and she was, was working at this retail store in Pacific Palisades, and she just saw how well it was doing. And it What was, were they selling? It was women's apparel. And it was a boutique that a, sells other brands. Yeah. Right. So she was like, we were starting to get over LA. Uh, this was like right when Keenan passed away, like 2001. Right. And we New, were like, New Year's. Yeah, we were like, what the fuck is going on? This yeah. whole like, everyone's fucked up here, like no one cares. Uh -huh. You know, and we were like, let's fuck it, let's move back to San Francisco. So mm -hmm. we moved to San Francisco and she was like, I want to do what I was doing in uh, LA, but I want to own it. So we did a lot of research and we were like, there's too many of this style of stores here in San Francisco what, already. What, what was the, this style of store? It's, it's like a contemporary women's store. Oh, so she wanted to open a women's store. Yeah. And you guys did research and you were like, it's too saturated. Yeah. So? So I was like, I've been traveling the world going, you know, whatever it is, LA, New York, Japan, London, all over. And I'm like, I love this kind of streetwear thing. I right. love the sneaker culture. I love skateboarding and I love streetwear. Right. And I was like, let's do that instead. Right. So tell me, wh what's that like? Like, because obviously people want to go do what you did. So like, if you were, tell us what that's like, you and your girlfriend, you have to go find a store, you well, have to go get yeah. accounts. We had people around us that, that did business right. or, or were educated enough. So we, you know, we talked to people, I talked to deluxe people. I was writing for Stussy, so I would go talk to Frank Sinatra there. Sure. And Frank just Sinatra kind of, is the owner of Stussy, not Frank Sinatra, yes. the musician. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just that, would have been, that would have been nice. <laughs> <laughs> but really just, I asked a lot of questions. I went to a lot of people and mm -hmm. asked people. I asked Thebo, I asked like everyone, anyone that I was kind of around, I would ask questions, you know, everyone would kind of help, but in the end it was on us. Right. It was like, no one gave us capital, no one gave us anything. We, we found a retail store. Now how did you pick your retail store for location? Honestly, we just drove by it and we were like, that looks good. We like the location, but we didn't do research that there's enough people going by there. Sure. Yeah. You know, we like the rent was cheap. Mm -hmm. The place was very small. Where, what neighborhood was it? It was uh, Upper Tenderloin. And um, so you didn't even think about like, there's lots of skaters nearby or people on the street are going to walk by. Well, there was close enough to downtown. It was on a bus stop. So people uh, would see it on the bus. Uh. And basically we just signed the lease. We figured out a name. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Why did you decide to use your name? 
So me personally, it was like Huff was my tag name. Like I was, I was a semi graffiti kid growing up in New York. This is true. It's, it's just kind of like the nature of the beast out there. Yeah, it is. And when I turned pro, I would put Huff on my boards. True. I would do all that. And I was coming up with the fucking worst names for the store. That tell was just, me. Oh, I don't even tell, me some kind of, tell me some good ones. <laughs> yeah. There was a fucking paper that I wish I had, but it was just like dumb shit. Sure. And Anne was like, you have to call it Huff. And I was like, hmm. I think I thought about it for weeks and I was like, no, 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 no. And then I was just like, everything on the paper looked like shit. Mm. Mm. So I was just like, let's do it. I, it's funny because for me, like, uh, when like the Zoo York, you know, I would always be like, thank God I can leave this at home. Yeah. You know, like I'm a different person. I can introduce myself. No one knows I'm connected to that. But like, if everyone's like, yo, Huff, I'm, I know there's times when people are like, wait a minute, are you Huff? Yeah, I still get it. <laughs> um, but my whole goal was, oh, you can just call it that and eventually like no, no one will fucking no. know and then it just fucking disappear. And it kind of has, it kind of has its own legs, yeah. but you know, it has a history. It does. You know, it has these skateboard, deep skateboard roots that yeah. the company needs to hold on to. So you, you start to shop. It's called Huff. You decide on it. H-U-F. Yeah. Put it over the door. Tell us what it was like your first year. I'm fucking embarrassed as hell. Like, I'm like, I'm just like... It's hard for me. Like I'm not. I'm not that guy to be like shouting out his shit. And um, you know, the store was actually fun. It was like we were. We had like Nike accounts, and we had Adidas and Vans. We had like these cool accounts, and we were at that time sneaker collecting was. It's already existed, but it was becoming extremely popular. Yeah. And we were getting the shoes that they wanted. The limited edition. Yeah. Dunk it was like era. you know. It was that time when it was like New York Dunks and Danny Supa and and Richard Mulder and sure. Reese Forbes or whatever. We were getting all these shoes. And the day we opened, we had a huge fucking line out the door. Really? I mean, I was scared we were gonna run out of product and would not have product the second day. <laughs> really? Yeah. It's an instant success. Instant, like, and I remember we were having lines for, we were putting New Era hats out and having lines for New Era hats. And we were just like, what the fuck is going on here? Cool. Like, uh, Here we are in California and, it's, <laughs> and weed is now legal. Yeah. just to go and buy for fun. But I, one of the things I always you know, noticed about Huff is you guys really went hard on promoting marijuana. <laughs> you know? <laughs> was that trend forecasting or you guys were personally into all this stuff? Like what was the idea behind that? So we did the weed sock. I think it was like 2004, Hani El Khatib came in and kind of became the creative director. Mm. And me and him get along really well and we design well together. He, he came up with the concept of doing these plant, these like weed socks. And sure. I was like, fuck yeah, let's do it. And right. the whole concept was you go to a party, you take off your shoes in someone's house, you have these fucking weed socks on, and a chick's gonna come up to you and be like, I love your fucking socks. <laughs> and. <laughs> so the socks, the concept is advertising that I've got weed. It's that weed, but it's also like people are gonna come and talk to you because of what you just took it off and you're like, oh, they're cool, right? This is true. I don't go to a lot of parties that I'm forced to take my shoes I know, off. But where is this? That was our concept of like, <laughs> you do go to like a, a, someone's house and they have you take your, your shoes off. It sounds uniquely California. <laughs> New York in the winter time, this, is, this concept is right out the window. And it worked. People well, basically, it didn't really take off in the beginning. We, we ordered them. We had them in our display case. Right. People bought them. I, mean, I remember even like Paper Magazine doing something on them. Mm. And it was just kind of like selling the bare minimum mm -hmm. for years. Right. And we even talked about not doing it anymore. And then all of a sudden, after we talked about not doing it, the next season, someone wore them somewhere. And now all, all of a sudden, every kid has to have them. So who is that person? I don't know. No one, no one, it was no like, I never got like an image of like Kanye West wearing That's it That's so thing. weird because like, uh, uh, you know, Chad Muska with Sky Tops, yeah. he knows it was Jay-Z wearing them. Diamond, you know, Lil Wayne wore it on the right. cover. Boom. You don't know who that is. No, we didn't have that. It was all of a sudden every high school kid wanted them. Every, huh. every girl wanted them. Every like, even like hip hop dudes or music dudes wanted them. And it was like all of a sudden, we can't keep up with the demand. Um, and another thing is we don't want to be known as a weed company because okay. we're not a weed company. Yeah. I mean, we like weed, we're not, you know, we're, Anti -weed. we're totally into weed, Right. you know. 
So uh, speaking of which, this is my own personal thing. Are you into masturbation? <laughs> what, what does, where was the idea to sell the jerk off? What are they called? What are you called? Pangas. How did that happen? Where uh, in the world did you g get the idea to sell a masturbation accessory item? The company approached us. Okay. And we were like, that's fucking cool. Sure. So Tanga's huge. Like they basically, Are they're they? a Japanese brand uh -huh. and they help people out that have like problems. <laughs> You're going to have to elaborate on this. Key. Uh, they don't have feeling in their penis or whatever. Like is this a sincere problem? Yeah. It's a, it's a medical company? It's somewhat of a medical thing, but it's a masturbation tool. Right. But the, I'm saying Tanga, it started as like a medical assisting yeah. thing and it's just turned into... Now they're just like in the sex toy world. Right. But I think their, their original thing was to like help people that had... Uh, Low sensitivity in their Yeah, no sensitivity or whatever these things are. Uh, you can go on their website and probably figure it all out. I probably out. will. <laughs> <laughs> but we came out with a, a, a sex toy and I mean basically like we had thousands of them and like we are... <laughs> You know, like every fucking employee is taking them. Like they're just disappearing rapidly. <laughs> Promos going out. People are fucking next day airing them from our website. Like what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, like, well, they've got to wait online. The hype beasts <laughs> to get the new drop. So you, you know, they're gonna climb in their tent, um, make sure it's tough. <laughs> and it was cool, man. Those dudes are so cool, yeah. and it's like it's a cool project to do. Like. I, I, when I saw it, I was, I, I was just like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. I, there's no way in the world I would ever, you know, conceive of that. But good for you for doing that. It is brave. It's brave as A lot fuck. of people, yeah, now poor, more people have done it. And, yeah. You know, it's just cool. The brand is cool. Yeah. You still make them? Uh, we would. I'm saying, you have one for me? No. <laughs> Maybe a used one. That's amazing. I know man. the guys at the store, they're always doing like, they're always doing like Instagram videos of like the girls sticking their fingers in it and shit like that. What? Like they lube it, they lube it up and like. <laughs> Sex and weed. You nailed it. There it is. Are you in this picture? No. Let me ask you something. It came up. I had a BMX bike at a certain point in the '80s. It was just if I went outside with my BMX bike, I was just gonna get robbed. Yeah. Constantly. Yeah. It was I couldn't deal with it. Yeah. Is that what happened to you? Yeah. Oh my god. We Did basically you get stolen? uh I never got my bike stolen, but my friend got his bike stolen. Right. And when his bike got stolen, his parents just went down to Alphabet City and rolled around, found the bike and just grabbed stole it back from the kids. <laughs> Some adults? Yeah. Give me that shit. I mean, I was oh. I was scared for my life. I used to get chased all the time. Me too. I had like a what bike did you have? I had a mongoose. I had a I had a, a redline RL22, yeah, yeah. like with mags, like a really nice one. Yeah. And it was just like a neon sign, just like rob me. And I remember just like riding around and I just hear like behind me that there'd be like 20 guys running after me. I'd be like, <laughs> I mean, you're faster on a bike unless they know, unless they have bikes. So ridiculous, man. That was half my childhood was fucking watching your back. I know. Yeah. You're like, fucking, am I gonna get robbed right now? Yeah. Good, I'm good, I'm good. That's why I think the skateboard was like a little easier because no one wanted it. No one was stealing skateboards. Yeah. And when we used to take the trains, like we used to take the L train all the way to Canarsie. Right. We used to open the seats, put our skateboards in there, and close them because it was the last stop, right. and then you could just get up and take your skateboard. Oh my god. Because dudes would come on the train and start fucking with you, right. and you just have to put your head down and be like, come on, just go away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, yeah. like, you're in the fucking hood. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that uh, guys like me and you would suffer from PTSD? From just growing up being marked, just getting into fights and getting robbed and chased all the time? That's part of it. I mean, I, I, I haven't gotten to my therapist in a long time, but that's half the shit I talk about when I go there. Really? Yeah. yeah. It's like how fucking gnarly New York City was growing up. I miss it. Yeah, there's part of it that you miss it, but it's not like that anymore. 